welcome. Uh, we've got a fantastic attendance today, primarily from Western Canada and uh, uh, across Canada, um, and a few from the States. Um, and I think uh, I saw one of our old friends from, from Kenya on the list too. So this is a crowd of cemeterians interested in cemetery business planning. Um, we are Lees and Associates, uh, Rebecca, Jennifer, and myself uh, with the able assistance of Lacey Barr and Patrick Beach back at the headquarters putting today's presentation on this is what we do cemetery planning planning design um uh, comprehensive planning physical planning and business planning which is why we're here today um i'm delighted that jennifer t bear from our shop is 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 joining us jennifer is a cpa um has extensive experience in cemetery business planning and um has fine-tuned our cemetery business case uh, analysis uh, tool and associated works and so she'll be uh, she'll be backstopping me on on the presentation and uh, Rebecca Anderson who you've you've already met and will be chairing the uh, question and answer part of today's session. This is the fourth in a series of webinars. Uh, when COVID hit in uh, spring of 2019, we decided to launch uh, a series of uh, learning opportunities for our, our friends and colleagues in the industry. Uh, if you have not had a chance to view our previous webinars, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, just search for us on YouTube, Lees and Associates. We have a channel there. Um, I think you'll find them very, very, very helpful. Today, we're gonna talk about cemetery business planning and, and Business planning in, in typically involves everything from human resources and operations, um, uh, promotions and marketing, uh, as well as financials. Today, we're going to be concentrating more on the financial side of things. It was uh, our perception that was where most of the interest was uh, on the, the financial uh, aspect of cemetery business planning. And uh, so we've uh, broken the presentation and the conversation up into um, two main components, the information you need to really get going properly um, and frankly to, to manage in a business-like way um, your cemetery. And then what are some of the, the appropriate models? How do you move towards financial sustainability and what are some of the instruments um, that, can, that are helpful? Just want to hasten to add, this is the basics of cemetery <laughs> business planning. I outlined some of the other main components of a full comprehensive business plan. And the same goes on the, the financial side. These are the basics. So this should give you enough information to speak intelligently to your finance people. If you are one of the finance people, hopefully it'll add more to your understanding of, of the nuances of cemetery planning. We like to talk about cemetery services as community services. Um, yes, we will be using words like market and total market and market capture, uh, which can turn some people off, uh, be, uh, frankly, because you know we're not selling widgets. We're selling a service and we're selling a service at a time of uh, uh, significance to families. And so we wanna keep that in mind. And it's within that context that we, um, feel it's imperative that in order to understand the demand, you need to understand who you are serving and what are their needs. Um, and so there's some um, empirical evidence around this. And interestingly enough, as, um, uh, as we were preparing for this presentation, um, it struck me that one of the key data sets that are missing is the, the temporal changes in uh, COVID infection rates across, uh, across our, 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 our country, county and, and, and cities. Um, those will provide, of course, short term impacts on unfortunately the services we provide, but is probably a slide that we should have included. So I just say that within the, the context of these next three or four slides. The demographics are, are really important to understand in your, your planning department or uh, your, your local county um, or provincial um, uh, stats services will have these. Uh, you need to understand what the age demographic is. And in, importantly um, uh, for us uh, at the tail end of the age demographics, this is where the baby boomers are. Now uh, we are into the demise of the baby boomer age our baby boomer um, uh, P 
period started later than in the States. And of course, it's finishing later than in the States um, for reasons which we can go into if you wish. But really important to understand the demographics of your, of your community, especially with respect to age. Eric, if I might, just thought I would mention that Statistics Canada and a few other uh, government agencies do, ex do expect that the aging of the North American population to increase the demand for cemetery uh, services more than we've seen in the past. Right. Very important point. Thanks, Jen. Now, what we've done with all these is uh, uh, we've removed any reference to any specific city for obvious reasons. But this is, uh, um, and some of these are typical, some of these are atypical, but very important to understand the religious profile of the community. Um, as with most North American communities, at least there's, there. 40%, usually around 35%, no religious affiliation. Um, and in this particular example, um, Muslims, Jewish people um, are do not register even higher th as much as 1%. But still very important to track those populations um, because, of course, they have very specific um, burial traditions and, and customs. And, 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 and that has a, a knock-on effect not only on the business side, but on on the, the physical planning side, because um, Muslims in particular and Jewish people require um, um, very prescribed uh, um, burial sites and, and alignments and so on. The ethnic profile is also important. Um, understanding where people are are from, um, where we are all from somewhere, with the exception of, of indigenous people who came long before all of us. Um, but that also has an impact on um, the services that are being provided, or or could some would say should be provided to the community. Southern Europeans, for example, generally more Christian, generally more Catholic, um, will generally um, uh, use and expect to see mausoleum more than, uh, than others. Um, um, those from Asia and South Asia uh, have specific uh, annual um, uh, community and communal uh, uh, experiences that um, have an impact on the cemetery and on the on the business of the cemetery. So uh, this, uh, the ethnic profile, the religious profile, and the, and the age profile of the community, when put together, uh, provide the cemetery manager with um, uh, valuable experience that is necessary to ensure a sustainable business plan. The immigration profile is an interesting one. You may ask, well, why are we considering that? Well, we're considering it because the new Canadians, the new Americans in our in our community and where we expect them to come from will drive the demand and the services expected um, and the expectation for, for those services in the future. Um, so uh, that, that is a, a key demographic to also watch. And then specifically with respect to how we dispose of uh, this corporal vessel after we're gone, um, the, the trend towards cremation for, for all of you, uh, I, I'm sure is, is more than evident, but this is, I think, a pretty graphic representation in the United States, the uh, number of US citizens that have chosen cremation has better than doubled in less than 20 years. It's a phenomenal shift in, in, in the disposition. Um, of course, uh, uh, burial makes up the better part of the rest of, uh, of, uh, of, of those choices um, with donation to science and, um, and uh, um, options like resumation as, as a, a much, much, much smaller percentage. But the, this trend is critical uh, for, uh, for our businesses. Um, and most importantly, how do we bring cremation families back to the cemetery? I'm sure all of you have experienced this, if not in your personal lives, your professional lives, that 
that more and more people just are not bringing their cremated remains to a cemetery. And that's a, that the, the question we ask all the time is where do all the ashes go? <laughs> Even though it's a, it's a word I don't like to use very, very often. Um, but that speaking of the demand and the total market is, is in, in incredibly important to understand the disposition trend and the disposition rate. In Canada, uh, Cremation Association of North America um, has done yeoman's work tracking um, the um, cremation rates uh, across the country, which is no small feat. And if there's one small silver lining to the COVID-19 crisis, it's that the value of, of current and, and accurate statistics as to uh, number of deaths, um, and the disposition of those uh, bodies uh, is, is, is becoming more current. Um, so it should make for more accurate uh, uh, projections and, and more, accurate, more accurate foundations upon which we can um, uh, plan our cemetery services. Here again, you can see, and this is the trend across North America, generally in the West, although Quebec, obviously, a very, very high cremation rate. Generally in the West, cremation rates much higher than it is elsewhere in Canada. And, and this can be said uh, as well for across North America. So then how does the community use your cemetery? What activity occurs there? Um, you might also refer to this as the um, as the business traffic, um, the volume of, of, of work you do uh, with families. Um, and we'll, we'll speak uh, here about interment and sales, that relationship and, um, and, and those ratios, uh, because those have a direct effect as to um, the way your pricing structure works and the, um, the revenue that's gonna be coming in. Now, this is a, a complex slide. I'm going to walk through this slowly. And always when you're looking at a graph, the first thing you want to do is look at that horizontal axis. It gives you the number of units. You remember grade 11 science where you're challenged, like always show your units. Well, these are the units. This is, in this case, years 2015 to 2019. The left upright axis, uh, vertical axis, in this case shows in the entire community, the number of people choosing casket burials or cremation. And those numbers are represented in that solid dark blue background color and the dark green background color. So um, that's how you read this part of the, of, the, of the graph. The numbers in the right are the actual activity um, in the community. So um, if you look at that top red line, that's the number of cremated remains that are interred on the site. If you look at the orange solid line, those are the number of caskets or traditional burials interred on the site over this period. And then the interesting nuance here, and it's, it's an important one for you to understand as you're, as you're projecting your, um, your needs and your revenues forward is the Cremated remains sales, that's the sales of either column barrier or, um, or in-ground burial plots, uh, and the casket sales, uh, how do those compare to the, those actually interred? And this begins to uh, tell the story then of the pre-need to at-need uh, relationship, although not entirely. Um, but this is all fundamental data that you really need to have at your disposal. And um, uh, you'd be surprised how many cemeteries do, do not capture this information. Um, obviously the total market casket and cremations is available through your um, the provincial or county city, city services, but the others is captured at the cemetery. I might also comment that it can tell you how your inventory is being used. If you have a case where you have your interments are far higher than your sales, that tells me that you may have uh, people you, having multiple interments into one grave, possibly even treating casket lots in the manner of a cremation estate. So it can tell you a lot of information uh, about 
how your customers perceive you and what you're offering. Yeah, it's a very good point, and it, it will affect, won't it, Jennifer, the, the, the type of marketing that you're doing as well. I'm going to turn this over to you, Jen, to talk about inventory and land capacity. All right. Uh, well, you can't look at the side of demand without looking at the side of supply. So it's important to uh, take a look at the composition of what you're offering uh, the, and the variety and see whether or not that is meeting the needs of your community. So uh, a lot of time what we do is we'll project ahead about 25 years or so uh, at the different offerings uh, and the demand for your inventory and compare that uh, to what you have available and what you can ex expect to be able to provide. And uh, it also gives you a chance to consider the opportunities uh, to make better use and optimize uh, the resources you have, uh, your big resource being the land. So you may have an opportunity to densify uh, and uh, even provide even more than you knew you had the capability of doing. Right. And the other thing uh, with respect to supply, which is a very good point, Jennifer, if you, if you need to look at demand, you need to look at supply to determine just where you are in that marketplace is, what about the other cemeteries? Are you surrounded by, um, by other cemeteries or are you the only cemetery um, that's serving your community? Um, that will have a significant impact on uh, what we refer to um, in a far too cold a fashion as a market capture. So Jen was referring a moment ago to those offerings and uh, there's lots of different ways this could uh, um, this could be discussed, but we've broken it down into diversity and also uh, price benchmarking. So diversity, this is a, a good example here. Uh, these are family vessels uh, into which uh, uh, cremated remains can be commingled either communally or uh, as a family uh, in a scattering garden. Um, so this is one way of enhancing revenue. Um, ensuring that there are ample opportunities for families to bring their cremated remains back to a meaningful place of, of, uh, of memory and, and community significance. Um, back to my point a moment ago about where do, where do all the cremated remains go? Um, the other important aspect though is, is, is looking at your prices. Um, uh, Many of you that are joining us today from the public sector will, will recognize uh, council's expectation of, well, where do we stand compared to the city down the street or the county across the way? Um, and so this is a generally a fairly easy um, bit of research to do. Um, many, um, many groups uh, uh, such as the WCCA and, and more informal um, cemetery groups are doing this on their own um, every year or two, uh, sharing, um, sharing their price schedules. And it gives you a sense of of where you are um, compared to other cemeteries. And, and you know, benchmarking is a, can be a bit of a mugs game. It's hard to compare apples to apples always. There are so many, it depends, uh, caveats that go, that go into it, um, but a very useful um, uh, activity to, uh, to, to, to do. Um, if you just look at this, uh, the first line, the adult casket plot, the cemetery in question here, the cemetery, uh, they're, they're charging for uh, uh, regular resident uh, uh, a little bit higher than um, certainly um, comparison cemetery B and a lot higher than comparison cemetery A. Um, uh, however, when you get down to the very bottom line under scattering, their numbers are more in the middle. So, um, these, this is a, this is not a science. <laughs> it's much more of an art, um, but a really important aspect of, of cemetery financial planning, because of course, um, the number of, of, of sales events, times the value of each of those events gives you your net revenue. It's not a whole lot more complicated than that. Um, one other comment I might add is also depending on the circumstances of the cemetery, some cemeteries can be perceived as more attractive than others, such as be due to their location or their, their landscape or, or various other elements that need to be taken into consideration. It's not just a number crunching game. 
Very, very good point. When we talk about records management in cemeteries, most of you think about um, a product such as Central Square or Opazenta um, that that converts all of the data and GIS into um, into a manageable uh, platform. But but here we're talking um, about capturing those records specific to the cemetery financial operations and um, working with your finance department and the clerk's department to be sure that that you're capturing, uh, for example, simple things like pre-need and at need. Can you um, go back to the office this afternoon and answer that question? How many of your sales are pre-need and how many are at need? You'd be surprised how many cemeteries, especially municipal cemeteries, cannot do that. Um, also on the cost side, um, uh, how, not, how many of the uh, operations activities at your cemetery are potentially um, executed by other departments? And are those costs accu accurately reflected in your general ledger um, on a ideally monthly basis? So um, Jennifer <laughs> has struggled with this uh, on almost every project for the last seven or eight years. And we want to make sure to emphasize to all of you the importance of a fairly fine grained level of data capture uh, going beyond just your, your normal who's buried where. If I could highlight three, three things that I would recommend every cemetery to track. Uh, both uh, on your activity level, you know, how many burials and such are we doing, uh, as well as on the financial, it would be three things. The time of sale, with at need, pre-need. Residency, where, where do your customers live, resident, non-resident. And thirdly, the form of interment. So it gives you an idea of the demand for your casket lots, for your niches, for your cremation lots, so you understand where the demand is. Uh, and, and again, matching it to what you have as supply. So those are the three levels that are key. Well said. Okay, Rebecca, do we have some questions we can, we can uh, answer? I have a couple of questions that came in before the presentation, but there weren't many in the question and answer box this time. So just a reminder, if you have any questions, please send them our way. Mm -hmm. um, so this, um, participant was wondering, with the increase of cremation rates, um, how do you see that impacting cemetery business planning? Ah, yes, uh, that's a fundamental question. Um, um, the first thing I think Jennifer would agree is ensuring there are a diversity of offerings. Many communities now have columbaria. Uh, big step forward, uh, although many still don't have any columbaria. Um, but what about, uh, what about scattering? Uh, what about uh, different forms of in-ground cremated remains and interment options? Uh, what about the family vessels? Uh, what about family columbaria? Um, um, what about ossuaries? Um, so those are just some examples. The list is a, is a long one. But, um, and then the other is, and you may be surprised to learn this, how many people in your community actually know that there is a cemetery where cremated remains are welcome? So many, so many uh, studies we have done uh, where we phone people up and we ask them, hey, have you heard about your local? Oh, I didn't know. I thought they were full or I thought they were closed or I didn't know they handled cremated remains. So it's as much a marketing um, challenge as it is a, a product or certainly not a pricing issue. Jennifer? I can think of two additional uh, key areas that represent opportunities from cremation. Number one, your cemetery is likely to be able to accommodate a lot more cremated remains than they are going to be able to accommodate uh, caskets. So uh, your land capacity has a lot more potential to serve uh, a lot more people, uh, perhaps putting off that day when you have to buy a new cemetery land. Uh, in addition, there's, not, there's, there's unique opportunities around cremation, such as memorialization without interment. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the, those cremated remains that aren't captured by the cemetery uh, do still have, the people still want to have a place to memorialize the, those family members. So um, it does have posed some challenges, most certainly, but there are some opportunities uh, out there as well. And uh, 
we have to keep our eyes open for them. Good question. Yeah. Um, so this kind of goes back to the, uh, the part of the presentation about community services. So they're wondering how well served are cemeteries to meet the needs um, for diverse religious and cultural groups? Um, from your experience, are there groups that are consistently being underserved, underestimated, or those that we need to pay more attention to? You know, I think this is something that, that cemeteries across Canada, especially in Western Canada, have done a, a remarkable job of. Um, the Muslim community, for example, um, uh, as a Muslim community has grown significantly over the, the recent decades, uh, we have uh, we've changed our rules, we've changed our layout and, and orientation pattern. I think we've done really well in that regard. Um, um, I'm not sure that we're serving families uh, as well as we might that, that want green burial or natural burial just yet. And I, I, I'm really concerned that we're not uh, serving Indigenous uh, communities very well at all, frankly. Um, uh, well, that might be overstating it. I think we could do a much better job of serving Indigenous communities better. I think there's definitely an opportunity to uh, expand the degree of personalization of those services that are offered. Uh, there is some degree of it happening out there, but it's by no means exhaustive and certainly not meeting all the potential groups that uh, uh, it could be serving. So that definitely deserves a closer look for most cemeteries, I'd say. Okay, I just have a couple more questions here. Um, so this person is wondering what factors and frequency of changes influence price adjustments? Oh, that's a good one. And uh, this is a lament that we sing often. Uh, and that is uh, increase your rates on a regular basis, ideally every year, ideally at or if you can slightly above inflation. Every year you miss means a more difficult decision for council to uh, uh, top the fees. Um, Many municipalities have a regular fees bylaw that they pass every January, everything goes up, you know, swim passes and ice rinks and so on. But oftentimes cemeteries are left behind in that regard. Um, so some of the, uh, you know, the communities such as the one we showed in that benchmarking table, um, they've got some big catch up to do there. And sometimes it's just better to bite the bullet and raise the fees. Um, and you'll see in the next part of the presentation, the imperative of perpetual care fund. It's not just meeting today's operating costs, it's the long-term contribution to those care funds that is really so important. And, and that as much as anything, wouldn't you agree, Jennifer, is why fees need to be um, at, a, at a market level. Most certainly. And uh, just as you say, Eric, um, you know, when you do a price, price benchmarking exercise, if you find out that you're offering rates way lower than everybody else, it's usually a good idea to uh, align yourself uh, with the normal market range. Um, but yet at the same time, consider your unique circumstances. Uh, very often rural communities very commonly price their cemeteries uh, lower than large communities where there's uh, in urban centers where there's land scarcity, you know, areas of land scarcity also tends to affect the pricing. Um, and uh, the diversity of offerings, uh, cemeteries sometimes that offer a wide range of offerings are, are perceived as being more attractive and uh, that can also affect pricing as well. So there are a number of factors to consider. Um, this is a somewhat related question. Do cemeteries usually charge for memorialization? Yes. Yes, there is. A, there, go ahead, Jen. I uh, said so they don't, uh, they often don't uh, offer markers in the traditional sense of flat markers and upright markers. That's often more of a funeral home and monument company thing, but they does not mean they don't have other offerings. Uh, bronze plaques are very common. Um, you know, sometimes uh, other things such as, uh, you know, that can be on a memorial wall. Uh, so that's a very common one. Sometimes statuary or engraved boulder markers. There's a few options that way. And I think it does speak to the, the comment Jennifer made earlier, which is memorialization without interment. Um, now I think the pendulum is swinging away from just taking grandpa out to the lake and, and his favorite spot out there. Uh, where are the grandchildren, where can the grandchildren go uh, to, uh, to see his grave? Uh, where is that, where is, is his story told? 
And um, so there are more and more creative ways uh, and innovations of both digital and you know, real hard Hard, tangible um, examples of, um, of of memorialization in in that manner. I think we'll leave it at there for now. Um, so I'll pass it back over to you for the second part of the presentation. Thanks for your questions. So we'll talk now about some financial models. Our sense is that most uh, uh, with us today uh, are from the public sector aspect. So we wanted to concentrate more on the tax subsidy. Uh, versus break even or profit, um, but the principles apply uh, regardless of whether you're balancing your own checkbook and looking forward to making sure you've got what it takes to pay the bills in the next month or whether you're looking forward uh, 20, 30, 40 years to uh, see your cemetery break even. Um, uh, you still look at the, the, the same, uh, the same uh, factors. So once again, Bottom axis is the years, in this case, in decades, looking out over 50 years. Um, the vertical axis is the amount of revenue uh, that's coming in um, or, <laughs> or expenses, as the case may be. Um, so the uh, green line is the, the revenue line. And starting off uh, just before 2020, the, the green line was below the blue line. So the Expenses were greater than the uh, than the revenue. Obviously, that means that the dashed yellow line may, makes a net negative balance. Um, in this particular case, the the break even scenario does not uh, occur until somewhere in the twenty thirty three range, and that's where revenues exceed expenses and now uh, we're, we're into the point of you can call it profit uh, or you can call it contributions to the care fund or contributions to the development fund um, of one manner or another um, or to simply repay uh, some of the capital costs. So um, the, this trend uh, of of uh, uh, local government running cemeteries in a more business-like fashion is something that I'm sure most of you on the line today uh, have, have seen or council has asked you about. Um, I hasten to add though that this particular graph um, represents break even in terms of operating revenue and operating costs. It does not take into account the capital costs. So um, who bought the land 80 years ago? Is that, has that been long since amortized? Uh, what about the purchase of land in the future? How is that gonna be paid for? Uh, or major uh, capital development costs? Um, those are usually funded in, at least in, in, in local uh, government-run cemeteries, um, from the overall capital tax dollar. I might add that this, what you see here, is uh, fairly typical. Um, the majority of cemeteries, public cemeteries that we've worked with, are at least to some degree uh, tax subsidized. So that is what we've encountered, although they're always working towards improving themselves. And I, I know I, I find on average they're about at least five to 10 years uh, off of uh, reaching that magical break even point. So if you or yourselves there are still running a tax subsidy, you're in good company. Well, and, and I, I think it's also important to say that it's entirely legitimate for council to say, we're comfortable subsidizing our cemetery services with hard earned tax dollars. That's a philosophy that, that we've had for years and we're proud of, we're serving the community and we're keeping the rates down. Um, there's, not, there, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, so to a certain extent, the speed to which you may choose to, to work towards break even, or, or even if that's an initiative, is, is a philosophical one that uh, the council needs to make, along with a whole bunch of others associated with cemeteries, of course. We've mentioned uh, the importance of perpetual care a couple of times uh, in the webinar. Um, this is uh, an, another graph here. So bottom axis, the next 50 years, vertical axes, are the uh, principal of the care fund on the left and the interest generated on the right. 
So the large blue triangular block is that represents all the money in the care fund now and into the future. The green line represents the interest income. And in this case, we're taking a, a about a three and a half to 5% um, return on investment um, money sitting in the bank. And, you know, that's, that's pretty ambitious, although not, not too far off what most municipalities are able to generate. Um, but it's not until late 2030s that this particular municipality will be generating enough income from their care fund to pay for the maintenance, even at a somewhat reduced level, um, at their cemetery. And um, there's some nuances associated with that as to whether you can in fact reduce the level of maintenance and how soon you, you might be able to do that if the cemetery is full or closes. Um, but the goal should always be to tuck as much away as, um, as the market will bear so that at some future date, long after most of us are gone, the cemetery will be self-sustaining even in the absence of tax base revenue, uh, you still need to keep the, uh, keep the grass cut and the fences maintained and the monuments safe. Yeah, one comment I might add here is the, the, the big goal we're aiming for is to reduce the long-term perpetual tax burden on the community. So the sooner you get uh, things in order in that regard, the sooner that benefit comes. So I'll talk uh, a bit about business goals. Actually, you know, Jen, why don't you handle this particular um, uh, topic, and then I'll, I'll I'll handle the next set of goals. Sure. And in pursuing financial sustainability, one important decision that can be asked to make is the level of service uh, it wants to provide uh, to to its residents. And in doing so, you have to decide. Well, if we want to main, uh, provide this level of service, how, many, uh, how much human resources, uh, how many people do we need uh, you know, delivering those services and how much equipment and how much fuel and supplies am I going to need to provide? And depending on the level of service, uh, that will vary. And the ultimate goal is to provide uh, a level of service at which the community residents are satisfied. So uh, everyone wants the best when they're the person being served, but the, the higher the level of service, the higher the cost. So these are all, uh, all manner, uh, manner of things that need to be balanced and, and considered. Yeah, well said. And then of course, uh, we've been talking about revenue side, but there's, there's the very important part of cost efficiency as well. Um, how can you um, utilize the resources, the land and the human resources you have to efficiently deliver those services? I think uh, we'd all agree we're doing it very effectively, uh, but how efficiently are we doing it? Um, are there ways of, of, um, of using outside resources, possibly even volunteers, uh, or reorganizing in such a, a manner that um, all of the services at a cemetery are executed by, by one department instead of multiple departments, which is still the norm in, in many parts of, uh, of North America. Um, and then you need to balance that with attractive aesthetics. Um, the best cemetery marketing, you'll hear, you've heard this over and over at, at many conferences, I'm sure. The best cemetery marketing is a well-maintained site and welcoming staff, professional staff. Um, and of course, it would uh, it behooves all of us to ensure the public safety and accessibility are um, at the highest uh, uh, level possible, um, especially uh, given that uh, the majority of people visiting um, newly interred sites are, are the elderly. And so we need to be sure they can safely move from however they get to the cemetery to the site and back again. So assuming you've got the uh, right background information, um, your understanding and you're moving towards um, cost efficiency and uh, revenue optimization, um, if not ensuring the tax base subsidy <laughs> continues at a, at a sustainable level. What are some of the key performance indicators that, that you might consider and use as, um, as your own um, 
uh, sort of milestones in, in that journey. Um, measuring and, and monitoring are uh, things that, that most other municipal departments do exceptionally well. Um, uh, and there's no reason why uh, cemetery services cannot be provided uh, with the same level of accountability. Uh, surveys and feedback collection are, uh, are, are maybe the most obvious ones. Many of you work within parks departments, so you're, you're familiar with, with those mechanisms. Um, but as we were saying earlier, understanding and uh, uh, gathering the information and then measuring the extent to which um, all of the, the families that choose casket burial in your community are coming to your cemetery. Um, if you're the only cemetery in your region, that number should be upwards of 80%. Um, there's going to be some family members that choose to go elsewhere or adjacent communities and so on. But generally speaking, um, if there's not too much other competition, you should be getting most of the casket market. The cremation market is a different story, as we've been saying. Um, many families just choose to leave the cremated remains on the mantelpiece or sadly not even picked up. Um, if, if you're... Uh, uh, if the number of families in your community that are choosing cremation and are bringing those cremated remains to the cemetery is about 20%, you're doing pretty well. So don't beat yourself up too much if, if only um, two out of five are bringing their cremated remains to your site. This is, as per the question that we answered earlier, the big opportunity for most of us uh, with respect to uh, cemeteries becoming more financially sustainable. Um, so 20%, wouldn't you say, Jennifer, is a, that's, a, that's a pretty good target to shoot for now um, on that the whole? Be, that would be certainly a strong uh, performance or, or, or a delivery uh, indication of successful delivery to the community. Uh, compared to uh, your peers, uh, other municipal cemeteries. Uh, I have to say that um, it's important to track and measure these things, but it's most definitely important, even more important to ask the question of why are our numbers this way? Uh, because something can be an indication that you aren't, we aren't uh, serving the, the community residents uh, and not meeting their needs to an adequate level. Uh, and uh, that's where going back to getting that, making sure you have a channel for feedback and communication with, uh, with uh, your community is very important. And this is, can be a reflection of the visibility of your site. It can be a reflection of the degree of community engagement that you have with your, you know, and the familiarity uh, your residents have with the site. These are very important things to consider. The pre-need to need sales ratio is, is really important one to understand. Um, in the private sector, this number is usually, the, the, the goal is usually two or better to one. So for every one at need sale, um, the private sector is hoping to capture two more. In the public sector though, most government run cemeteries are fortunate to get maybe 0.75 to one. So barely equal split um, for every new at need family that comes in, only three quarters of them are, are choosing um, to purchase uh, another or a similar um, product or service. Um, we're not saying that you need to necessarily accelerate all the way to the, to the where the private sector is at but as Jennifer is saying it's it's it, it poses the question well why is uh, why are our pre-need sales uh, and and ratios so much lower than at need um, is that an is that a matter of marketing is that a matter of having more information at the counter is that a matter of our um, sales uh, and customer relations staff um, needing needing more training or um, who knows? There's a myriad of reasons why. I'd like to add that pre-need sales uh, early on can be very powerful financially in the long term because you get that contribution to the care fund earlier on. If you compound the interest over time, it's a longer period in which you can grow and contribute to your cemetery. Um, and really the only downside 
it is that you have to keep track of that future obligation to deliver the services. So that's the thing that goes along with it, but it can be very powerful for financial sustainability. The other one that's uh, uh, helpful and we're, we're finding that many uh, councils are asking, well, how, how does our staffing level compare to our neighbors? So it's another good benchmarking exercise. So this, uh, this can be measured in, in, in different ways. Uh, the number of full-time equivalent staff per developed acre, the number of full-time equivalent staff for, uh, for the number of bur- uh, uh, traditional casket burials. Um, are, those are just two of, of multiple different ways of, of measuring um, this human resources to land ratio. Um, Um, I would say it's a measure of efficiency, operating efficiency. Uh, There is a cautionary note, though. Lower is not always better. Theoretically, fewer people to deliver the service and uh, and, uh, do your operation is more efficient. But if it's not to the level of community satisfaction, that uh, could be uh, that could not uh, could be not a good thing. So something very important to look at the why. Very good point. Very good point. Operating financials, how, how are you as far as a break-even point? Are you moving in that direction at least? Um, and important here to keep, keep in mind that some, some years there's just there's fewer deaths. There's just simply less volume. But guess what? You still have to cut that grass every week. Um, you still have to keep, uh, keep the, uh, the desk uh, occupied. So um, don't beat yourself up too much if there's a, a dip for a year or two or even longer. Although we certainly expect with the uh, with the baby boomers and and other considerations, which will go unnamed right now, uh, that the deaths in our community are, are going to be increasing um, in the medium to long term. And then uh, w- w- how is your perpetual care doing? If you have not done a full analysis of that, um, that should happen uh, soon. Um, because it's one of those kind of hidden aspects of cemetery management that you can get caught up in the cutting of the grass and serving the families and the budgeting and all the other things that go into um, your management work. But uh, if the perpetual care fund is not on a steady, nicely uh, sloped increase, um, you're, you're basically falling behind. Inflation is going to end up eating you alive. And so being clear on, on, on where that uh, sustainability point is and your progress towards it is, is, is really imperative. And to that end, records management coming in here again, you really want to pay attention to tracking what your maintenance costs are. Uh, That's another thing on the cost side I cannot encourage enough for people to improve on for its financial records management. Accurate, accurate operating costs. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. Um, Rebecca, over to you. Good timings. We have a couple more questions here. So um, this participant is wondering if there's a noticeable trend towards limiting the term of plot ownership, um, where there's limited space or cemeteries are full. Well, I would say there's a notable trend in the discussion of uh, fixed term leases. Um, How many municipalities or frankly provincial uh, and state agencies are allowing it is, is I think, um, the more <laughs> the more critical um, uh, fact, and, and sadly, there there are not too many. Um, Vancouver uh, has 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 made great strides in this direction. Uh, Quebec has had uh, is it a ninety year or a ninety nine year lease? Uh, Ken, you might know the answer to that question. Um, so that's a fixed term lease. It's an exceptionally long mm-hmm. fixed term lease. Is it? Do you remember, Ken, what the number is? Yeah. It's, it's 99. 99 years, um, which, of course, when I was 30 years younger, that, that seemed like a long ways off. But <laughs> not, and it, still, the principle is there. Uh, at, at, at the 99-year point, families are approached. Do you want to renew your lease? Um, and uh, North America is unique in this uh, example, and I won't take too much of our valuable time to say that uh, we're one of the few places that bury in perpetuity with no one else using that grave ever again. Almost everywhere else in the world has some form of fixed term lease. And, and I think it's going to make a huge difference towards the financial sustainability. Uh, it's not a matter of if, but when. 
um, it may take the next generation to push that that boulder up the hill. All right, um, I'll move on to the next question, unless you have something to add, Jen. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm good. Eric answered it quite thoroughly. Okay, great. Um, so this participant is asking, if we're thinking to make physical changes to our cemetery, i.e. adding a scattering garden, trees, uh, what is the best route to um, undertake this process? Should we do an architectural landscape assessment? I, given the context here today as we're talking about the financial plan, it's, it's a good opportunity to say that the physical plan, such as a landscape plan or a, a, a new column area, really should be synchronized with the finances. Um, you may find that, for example, memorial trees in the long run, it may look like a revenue generator, but when those trees need to be maintained, when they get vandalized, <laughs> maybe not so. Um, so uh, yes, ultimately you need to synchronize with the business side, but um, yeah, this is, a, this is a planning and design exercise or maybe somebody in your department or you know, there's two or three consultants like us in Canada that can, uh, that can help you out in that regard. Um, but it should be done deliberately because uh, there's there's some there, there can be some downsides to just plunking trees in or plunking a bench in. Eric, to add to that, I think uh, the ultimate benefit would be for a lot of cemeteries to pursue a cemetery master plan that that looks at both components and ties them together. So to have a holistic look. Yeah, yeah holistic is a good word. All right, we got a couple more here. Um, so. You spoke a little bit about marketing. Uh, this participant's wondering if you can give a couple of examples of marketing strategies that municipal cemeteries can utilize, um, especially when budgets are limited. Go for it, Jennifer. Well, there is some low hanging fruit when it comes to, um, to engaging your community. And that is probably one of the biggest things that you can do uh, on the marketing. There is some social media that is very free uh for use the the main cost is the time cost of your staff to uh update uh and uh, provide content for those uh another th recommendation is partnering with your local uh organizations in your community like genealogical societies and museum historical societies sometimes they can organize tours in in the cemetery that can uh, bring people to the cemetery site and a lot of this can be done at little to no cost other than a little bit of time, uh, you know, of you working with and other groups. So, um, so there's a range uh, of ways cemeteries uh, do marketing, um, but they don't have to cost a lot of money. It's just a, a little bit of manpower and reaching out and creating those relationships with other members of your committee that would be interested. I, I might just add that uh, you, you mentioned master plans a moment ago, Jennifer. One of the indirect benefits of a master plan, the marketing, because mm -hmm. master plans involve engagement and raising the profile of the cemetery and the community so that we get people's input, right? Um, and that's when people come forward and, oh, man, I, I didn't know the cemetery was still open or, you know, glad to hear you guys out in the community. I just had to make a tough decision for in my family. And so keep, keep that in mind as well. So we have a question regarding pre-need versus at-need ratio. If rather than purchasing additional property, folks are choosing to purchase a property with occupancy that can accommodate their plans and needs, i.e. traditional lot that can accommodate for interments, um, how best to factor that in when crunching the numbers for inventory, uh, the supply and demand ratio? Yeah, that's tough. And that goes right back to our um, this chorus we've been singing all day, which is get your data together <laughs> uh, and keep it keep it up to date. If you know the pre need to need ratio, you can project your 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 gross revenue. Um, but yes, how will that convert to number of interments in that site? And really, all you can do is go on your historical data. Um, how, how, how many, in, first of all, how many interments do you allow uh, and of what type? And are people taking full advantage of that? Um, the cremated remains, uh, I, I think this is uh, one, one area in particular where uh, we could do a much better job of, um, of uh, monitoring the, the, the capacity for interment of cremated remains in established in-ground traditional plots. Um, 
Yeah, we it's 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 a it's it's a tough one to project, but that's all you can really do as far as projecting your revenue is look at the historic trend. Records management is king here, and uh, it, even if you don't have a long history of necessarily your current capacity, even if you started today, open up an Excel spreadsheet or whatever software you are using, and start tracking how many earns and, 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 and you know go into those plot so you can get an idea, uh, an average of well, what is actually being used. And you, you, can, you, you can always add that nuance to projections um, it, once you know it. But you have, it's the, the key thing is to establishing a precedent to get some sort of um, evidence-based uh, way of moving that forward. I think that's your new slogan, Jen, records management is key. <laughs> Um, so we often get a lot of questions about perpetual care. So um, I'll ask you another one. So are you aware of any cemeteries that would have a mix of fixed terms leases and perpetuity? Again, diversifying what you have, um, possibly costs less for something that has a fixed term lease. I'm certainly aware of models like that in Europe, um, but not really here in, in, um, in North America. It's either usually either one or the other. And the, the fixed term leases are still predicated and based on the fees associated with perpetual care. So, I mean, that would be another great way, wouldn't it, to uh, get people to consider a fixed term lease, lower the cost a little bit. Uh, keep in mind that the perpetual care is still got to be populated. You still have to gather that. And that can be, you know, anywhere from 25 to 40 percent of the cost of a grave. Uh, so this is just a general question. What are cemeteries typically doing with government funded uh, slash paid for lots when the family members want to use them later? Um, do they charge family a specific rate or not allow future uses? I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but um the rates uh, are set out in a in a in a price schedule in the bylaw and that's what has to be charged uh, there's not really much leeway a cemetery manager has in that respect uh even if they come along later and inter cremated remains in a in a grave lot they they pay the going rate at that time for that interment um, yeah they may be referring to indigenous uh lots uh that uh the government's paid for and maybe there's a question there about whether there's additional use by the family of that indigent as well. So um, that, that isn't something that has come, uh, commonly uh, come up uh, across our radar at this time. Yeah, yeah, it would not be a, um, a very common um, yeah. event. All right, so I'll just have to, a couple more questions. So um, especially since this is the uh, Western Canada series, this question is about the difference in costs between summer maintenance and winter maintenance. Yeah, summer burial or winter burial is another way of putting it. Um, uh, I, I'm always humored when when we, we run across cemeteries, oddly enough, in in, in the Maritimes and uh, in Ontario, where they just don't do winter burial. And I think of our friends in Fort McMurray <laughs> and uh, uh, places in Alberta where, where they bury year round, uh, they make it happen. Um, obviously there are winter costs associated with that, but there usually is not a surcharge for a winter burial. Um, or for that matter, a burial in the summer, you know, when it can be really wet. Um, the cost is the cost. Uh, there are costs associated with uh, with Saturday burials. Oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, there's some overtime costs uh, built in. Um, but um, normally speaking, the, the 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 price to the customer cost is uh, is the same year round. Uh, I might add one thing to that. Uh, I've noticed there is, uh, it's not unheard of that a winter premium comes in. Uh, the, the place I've noticed it mostly is in the prairies mm. where that seems to be introduced. Less, uh, You don't see it on the West Coast and uh, I'm surprised I don't see it more in Ontario, but uh, that prairies is where that team seems to appear. And we'll just ask one more question. So um, this participant is wondering if there's a, a formula or template for perpetual care assessments working towards a level of service. Uh, no, there, there isn't. Um, 
Uh, I think that Jennifer and I would probably both agree the sooner you can top up the perpetual care, the better. Um, and I think most, most managers would probably agree with that. Um, but whether that's, uh, um, but there isn't a template to get there. Um, and, and at the end of the day, it comes down to what can the market bear? There's, there's no way you can start charging a hundred percent premium on the, the sale of a grave for perpetual care overnight. Um, it's just, it's just not going to happen. The pushback and council pressure would just be too high. Um, we have um, suggested in some cases and, and in other cases, communities have just and done this on their own. Um, if there's a um, extra surplus in any given year, boom, goes right into the perpetual care. Uh, just because they know they are so far behind and they know that if they do that, even on an on a, uh, irregular basis, that that will really help things out. Um, but there isn't there isn't really a, a formula, and of course every 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 province, every state has has different um, mandatory requirements for contribution to the care fund, and of course most managers uh, on the webinar today would 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 know that. I might add too that uh, assessing the perpetual care fund is really very difficult because we're usually dealing with a very long timeline. And the further you go, you you move out, the the more challenging dialing in the accuracy can be. So it's hard to tie in today to, to tomorrow. Um, we certainly have our methods of uh, trying to guess what that future cost might be, and uh, so then we have an idea of well, how much that's going to be the income that we're going to need to actually generate that, and then you can sort of backwards engineer the balance you need to be at. So. Um, but it, it is in some ways more of an art than uh, a science. And uh, uh, the best bet is uh, contribute early and often, as Eric says. And one strategy uh, some um, people also do is sometimes we've seen uh, land sales where a city will set, sell a bunch of land and make a large principal contribution to help boost up their numbers. So there are a few levers you can pull, a few strategies you can take, and uh, it depends on your, of course, your, your unique situation. Well, I guess we'll leave it there for today in terms of questions. As always, uh, send us an email. I'll put our email address in the chat if you have additional questions that you think of after. Thank you.